Kinta, Owisawak Sunksquamatai Mutahash. What I said to you was, hello, good day. Uh, my name is Chief Many Hearts, Lynn Malerba. I didn't get married until I was an old lady, until after I had made my bones. And I knew this about me. I did not want, I knew I could not have any distractions. I think the women of the world now are aware of the dynamic of, of change and how we are needing to be a part of that and a good part. We just have to learn how to teach the students in front of us. Students already know how to learn and we just have to figure out what their gift is, what their talent is, and teach them as an individual. Waterbury is a very special place. You know, if you go back to the turn of the century, the time of the war, we had factories, a booming industry, a really blue collar town. And then as the factories left, many families left, many people left. And you really have to have a different level of investment here. I grew up in the Waterbury community. Uh, Waterbury is, well, Connecticut is a very unique state. You know, we have some of the wealthiest communities, we have some of the poorest communities, and schools look very different depending on where you grow up, where you live. And I grew up right here in Waterbury in one of the largest housing projects in the city. I went to Waterbury Public Schools, and all my life I was a part of this community. I grew up right here in Uncasville on Mohegan Hill. It was called Mohegan Hill, not because we owned it. We only owned a parcel of the church. That's as much as our reservation shrunk to. Uh, but it was called Mohegan Hill because all, so many Mohegans lived there. And um, so I grew up on Fielding Terrace, which was my grandfather's land. Um, and so I grew up with my grandmother living next door, my mother's twin sisters living down the street, two of her cousins living on our street. And so there was no getting into any trouble. So I grew up in the 50s with a dad who was an equal partner in our household, helping with childcare, doing the dishes, helping with the cooking, doing whatever with my mom. Always said, you know, my mom has her job during the day, I have my job during the day, but when I come home, we do everything together. So I always had that worldview. It was um, a time of, I think, great calmness in the country when I was a child. Um, we were over the war. We were um, thriving as a country then. It, I have a, a, a great example of strong women in my life. My mother really was the heart of our family and she um, kept us all grounded. My father was a news broadcaster, so sometimes he wouldn't be able to have dinner with us. Auntie, my father's younger sister, at a time when most women didn't um, take this type of position, she became part, head of the WPA in Norwich, which was the Workmen's Progress Association after World War II. She was a great example to me of a woman taking her place. I went to elementary school in Torrington, Connecticut. I went to high school in White Plains, New York. My father, he died of a heart attack at age 51. Boom. So that what kind of pulled the rug out from, from, you know, I was the only child in our family. And my mother just, uh, she went back to work. She found out that the men that she worked with, same, same level, same job, in fact, I think she supervised them, uh, were earning more money than she. So she went to complain about it. And this is what she was told. Mildred, you don't understand, these men have families. That was important. I think I saw a very strong female presence. I understood very early on what it was like for women in the workforce. Uh, she said this to me, you know, I'm gonna pay for your college, you're going. She says, education, nobody can ever take that away from you. She picked St. Joe's and she thought this would be a good thing. And I said, well, okay, fine. The dormitory life at St. Joe's was very um, nourishing. We're a group of young women, first time out on our own, and I have lifelong friendships. Some of my friends took different routes than I did, for sure. You know, many of them got married right after uh, college. You know, this was the 1950s. I got there in 1958. 
And everything in, in America was quite conformist. And that's one of the first lesson I learned there is outward appearances, outward manifestations really count. My academic journey was quite circuitous. It was not a straight line to from childhood through school on to university and then I became a teacher. I wish it were that easy. <laughs> no one in my family had ever gone to college, so I found myself always seeking questions, asking questions. Oftentimes I didn't know what questions to ask, so I was very curious. I always did well in school, but in high school I got pregnant. I had my daughter. So for a while it didn't even seem like college was possible. I never thought that St. Joseph's would be the place where I would end up. It was an all-girls school, <laughs> and I just didn't seem, I was so not St. Joseph's. But something struck me. I went to an information session, and one of the first things they talked about <laughs> they put up a picture of their conceptual framework, and they talked a lot about teaching the whole child, and not just academics, but teaching with heart, and teaching a community. And I remember in that session thinking, this is the school for me. <laughs> because I had been doing that, but I really didn't understand what that meant. I didn't know that there was a name for it. I didn't know that there was value in it. I went to a three-year nursing school, so you received a diploma at the end of three years and your cap with the stripe on it. But I knew that if I wanted to progress in the field of nursing that I would need to get my bachelor's degree. St. Joe's was um, perfect for me. They had this very creative program and it was RN to BSN. And it was a part-time program, it was in the evenings, and I was really impressed with the mission of the school as well as the Sisters of Mercy and the fact that they're educating people to really go out into the world and do good things. And so that connected with me because that's truly what I envisioned myself doing when I was in high school, going, going out in the world and doing good things, one by one, you know, really interacting and engaging with people in a way that would make their lives better. Well, my parents um, took me to see only women's Catholic colleges. We pulled up to in front of the, to McDonough, the, which we call the administration building then, and sweeping down the steps was Sister Mary Theodore with her Hat, black habit and her beads jiggling and she rushed over to the car and opened the door on my mother's side and said, I am so happy you are here. We must have lunch now. And so the three of us and Sister Mary Theodore had a very lovely lunch. And you can imagine how my mother and father were hooked on this college after this. The Sisters of Mercy were very concerned with the education of women and of women taking their place in society and giving back to society. I would definitely not pay myself as a model student. I did not keep regular hours. Um, they thought I did, but I didn't begin even thinking of doing homework until after hours, and I would take my little chair. Actually, it was a inverted wooden box. They had tubs in the bathroom then, and that's where I set it up in the tub. <laughs> and I would sit at one box with a typewriter on the other after lights out and do all my typing in the middle of the night and the nuns would come by and they'd hear noise and they'd tap on the door and they would say, um, is everything all right in there, dear? And I would say, oh yes, oh yes, it's just fine. And I said, well, gee, I'd like to get into advertising and PR. That looks interesting. Entry level position, door slamming. They, well, they, I could have gotten in, but it would be in the typing pool. I really did love history, and I, I got a teaching job in um, teaching high school history. Of course, you had the women's movement at the end of the 60s, but you had something very important to my career. The women of Newsweek, who came in as uh, researchers, I believe that, that was the term, they came in as researchers, but they could never be writers. They were just there to support the men. and. Somebody found out that in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, there was a clause that said you cannot discriminate, and I went through, you know, race, da 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 da, gender. So they brought suit against, they brought two suits against Newsweek, and Newsweek had to let them in. 
and several, just about two years later, I entered ABC News. Once you're in, they had to at least let you do the job. I came in as chief of research uh, for what ultimately became uh, Nightline. It was called America Held Hostage for a couple of months. Many times I, I would beseech him, you know, give me the experience. You know, I'll do both. I'll do the research, and but I want to see what producing is all about. And that was a year-long fight. I, I worked all the shows, you name it. Worked Good Morning America, which I did not like because of the hours. Um, I worked in the documentary unit 2020, I liked a lot. World News Tonight. I would go on set and they would talk over my head to the camera guy, right? That happened more often than not. And I would have to correct them and say, I'm the producer in the shoot, you really have to talk to me. The stuff I liked the most, Pierre Salinger was the press secretary to uh, Jack Kennedy. Ultimately, he joined ABC and he was going to do this documentary and I got picked. As a producer, I always came prepared. I knew exactly what it was that I needed in the way of video, interviews, whatever. And that's, all, that's the only thing that counted. Then I got other Pierre assignments. Uh, there was one in Rome where I spent almost three months investigating the shooting of the Pope and money laundering. When there was something that I liked, and that turned me on, I would work harder, I would work longer, I would work smarter. I wasn't afraid to work. It is now my privilege <laughs> I'm sorry, don't kick me out. <laughs> When I got the call that I was the National Teacher of the Year, there was a long pause, and the first thing I said was, why? <laughs> and I remember that, and it was very humbling. Just, first of all, there's 3.5 million public school educators in America. So to think that, first of all, you're gonna represent all these teachers, and second of all, that you did something that made you stand out amongst all of these people was so incredible. And then I just thought, what a tremendous assignment. You know, what a tremendous responsibility. And I wanna make sure that I include all of the people in my school and all of the people in my district and all of the voices of all of the teachers, you know, that I've taken classes with or shared a space with. You know, it really becomes so much bigger than you. So I have spent this year traveling the country and the world advocating for public education. Being an ambassador to the profession means that my students have a voice in this conversation. It means the work that I do, the work of educators is important and I get to speak on behalf of all of the teachers and administrators and universities and all of those people who have a stake in education. And it's interesting because people think that winning National Teacher of the Year is as good as it gets. And I just see it as a reset. You know, I come back with everything that I've learned and, you know, try to do something more. Kids come to school and our job is to teach them wherever they are, you know, to provide them with whatever they need. And sometimes they have families that support us in that role and sometimes they don't. But it doesn't change what teachers need to do. The announcement was made on a Thursday on the CBS Morning Show. So I came to school on Friday, and the energy in this building that day, my kids were so incredibly proud of who they were and where they went to school and what this place represented. And I hadn't seen that, and I don't think they believed it. So even though I was the one being honored, it made it real to them, you know? so on so many different levels, you know, racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, gender. I saw people in this building who were proud to be students at Waterbury, who were proud to go to Kennedy High School, who said, what do I need to do to graduate? It was just a reminder that, you know, they have the ability and the capacity to change the world, to do incredible things, not just in this community, but outside of this community. <laughs> 
I always wanted to uh, have a career that touched someone's life and made a difference in someone's life, which is why I chose the field of nursing. It was back in the era where patients had ashtrays by the bedside for their smoking convenience. Nurses were smoking in the back room as they were getting report on their patients. It was a little crazy. Um, and there weren't all of these very high tech uh, capabilities back then. So there were no IV pumps. You had to count the drips, you know, to make sure your patient was getting the right dose. Um, no automatic blood pressure cuff. So if you had a very critically ill patient, you'd be taking their blood pressure every 15 minutes uh, by hand. Um, but it was very high touch. And so it, it taught us how to be uh, good observers and good communicators and to really kind of uh, engage the patient in their own care. So and I also found that as a nurse, if you're not the one raising your voice to advocate for someone, no one else is going to. So I went from this very shy kid to someone who says, well, no, because if it's not me that's going to raise this issue, then who will? I did that uh, for over 20 years. Um, I, my goal was to be the vice president for patient care services, and I was this close uh, to doing that. Um, when uh, the tribal council at the time said, you know, we now have economic development here, we now can provide programs for our people, and we'd like you to come and help devise those programs. Nothing could be more flattering than to have all of the people who watched you grow up say, come work for us, you know, that's pretty flattering. Um, but I said, no, you don't understand the position that I want is available. <laughs> They told me that they, I have to commit to five years. Um, so it was really a very difficult decision for me. Um, but I ended up making the decision from the heart. I said, well, you know, our tribe has really struggled over the years and it's wonderful that we've come as far as we have. And all of the tribal leaders that preceded me and us had such faith in their people and always wanted to be able to provide services to them that if I wanted to have an opinion, and if I wanted to continue the work of the people that came before me, then I needed to be here physically and to work for the tribe physically. It was very surprising to me to be uh, appointed the chief, um, and, I, and I guess it's not surprising and probably a little overdue um, in, in terms of our tribal traditions. We had a female chief in the 1700s, Anne Uncas. I refer to myself as the first female chief in modern times. I hope that both the young boys and girls understand that it's really just about equality, right? And it's really about um, having perhaps the right attributes to be a chief. So my name, Chief Many Hearts, goes right back to my very early career as a nurse. When I was named as chief and prior to my installation as chief, our medicine woman met with me and said, well, you know, you really, it's time. You have to take a Mohegan name now. And, and she said, I think your name should be Many Hearts because you've held many hearts in your hands in the past and now you hold our hearts in your hands and you care for our tribe now in a very personal way. So my focus um, became trying to make sure that we had safety net services for people who were in need of that, but also to provide real community services to all of our people for all ages. And so I was able to develop uh, services for our, our, our elderly folks that one, allowed them to stay and live at home with support and as independently as possible. And two, I was able to work with our housing authority to build our um, our retirement community. Then the second group that I worked with is our youth. And so we did a lot of recreational and community services. You know, we try to make sure that those kids feel as connected to us as those of us who are lucky to grow up here do. And then lastly, um, we provide social services to folks that maybe are struggling a little bit with, you know, issues within their lives. But the one overriding theme, I think, is really to meet people where they are and to make sure that they feel an equal part of this community. My first teaching job was at Pulaski High School in New Britain, and I loved it. I was a senior English teacher and head of the drama department in my freshman year. Sister Ancilla was so proud of me. And then shortly thereafter, I became an intern, a White House intern during the Kennedy administration, and that was um, just a great experience. And of course, it ended tragically. But shortly after that, one of the most wonderful things of my life happened, 
and that was I went to the Yale Harvard crew races and met my husband. He tried to get away from me, but I pursued him. And I started decorating, so I got a license to have my business, and I uh, started doing bedrooms, um, master bedrooms. Then someone asked me, who lived in um, Palo Alto, to do their whole first floor. I was just overwhelmed, and I just loved this challenge. When we moved to Chicago, I did get out of the residential end of the business, so I became a, what was called a contract designer, and working with companies. My parents um, really instilled this in us, that we, we should give back to those who have helped us. And sometimes you give back by doing, and sometimes you give back by sharing what you can. So we started giving uh, in small amounts, of course, and uh, Winnie was having a capital campaign and we wanted to help her. We, we were looking for a project on the campus and Mike Jednak at the time was head of all the groundskeeping. And Mike said, you know what, Winnie, this college needs? This college needs an entrance. And when he said, well, it has an entrance, he said, but nobody can find it. We need to have some type of gate or something that will mock the entrance to this college so that people can find it when they come. And I said to myself, that is it. And so that's how the gates came about. It just makes me so happy and so proud. So very, very proud. I have been honored and blessed to be a trustee and that is something that I value and I treasure. When I look back now and think about so many things and what I have done, I say, thank you, God, for the Sisters of Mercy who really gave us what we needed but might not have realized at the time. I think it's very important also for women to get involved in politics, to run for office, to be out there. It's not an easy thing to do. It really isn't. But I think that's important because the nation has to see women in positions of power. I want to be able to answer questions that kids don't even know that they have. I want to be able to, you know, show them a path so that they don't waste the amount of time that I did, you know, to get to their goals, to get to, you know, whatever they envision as a dream. Take the risk. You can always go back. But if you don't take the risk, you have nothing to go back to. I am conch wachi ompitok. It means dream for the future. And it's the perfect phrase because I think we always should have dreams for the future. And we may not understand what those dreams may mean, but in Mohegan, we know that if we dream it, we can achieve it. And I think that's so important for everyone to make sure that you continue to have dreams no matter how old you are.